Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. I've got a friend today with whom I'm going to have a conversation and invite you to join in with us. He's Randall Roth, Professor Emeritus of Law at the University of Hawaii School of Law Richardson. He's a distinguished member not only of that faculty, but also here in the community. You may know him from his series of books called The Price of Paradise, or maybe his blockbuster called Broken Trust, in which he chronicled the demise of the then Bishop Estate and all that was going into that uh, debacle at the time. But lately, he's been active in some contemporary issues, particularly the Honolulu Rail. And for about the last five years, he and I have been talking and writing about it, in fact, even longer in his case. And I welcome him to the program today so you can get an inside scoop as to how he thinks about the Honolulu Rail Project. Please welcome to my program today, Randall Roth. Randy, welcome, good to have you back. Wonderful to be here. Well, it's always good to have you here. You know, tell our audience just a little bit about some of the projects you've worked on that has brought your name into the public eye, particularly The Price of Paradise. Now that started out as a bunch of essays on basically how expensive it is to live in Hawaii, but there is a theme underlying it about the way things work here politically. Right, the, the title of The Price of Paradise uh, was a take on an old quote about the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Well, the price of having a, a home that is paradise to you is paying attention to know something about the various issues that are controversial within our community. So each chapter of the first book was about a controversial issue, whether it be cost of living or the uh, high level of taxes or transportation issues, public uh, transit. Um, the book went over well, sold many, many copies. Uh, schools, high schools, and, uh, and colleges in Hawaii were using it in the classroom. So we did a volume two, and that did well. So we started on Hawaii Public Radio, uh, the Price of Paradise radio show, where we would have guests in to talk about controversial issues. Um, so that was kind of my introduction as somebody who would uh, attempt to get the community as interested and informed as possible right. about issues that, um, that sometimes there just isn't enough time in the day uh, to really be up to speed on. In fact, a lot of people use the term price of paradise as a buzzword today, talking about something that we all know too well, and that is the high cost of living. Why is it that we continue to put up with Hawaii's high price of paradise? Well, there, there's a, a long answer to why things cost as much as they do. Well, give me um, the short one, because we're going to get to the rail soon. Uh, the short <laughs> one, well, you've talked about the Jones Act uh, a lot, and we're obviously <laughs> yes. in a very isolated sort of place. Uh, but part of it is that we don't have competition in the political realm, and so our politics, uh, quite frankly, don't work uh, as well here as they would if we had a little bit of, of competition. I, I wrote a piece for Honolulu Magazine one time um, talking about whether politics in Hawaii was broken, and the short answer is yes, <laughs> and I think that's related to rail, how rail got as messed up as it is and why it doesn't work any better than it does, and I think that's related to another issue that I was involved in 20 years ago with, with uh, four others, I co-authored a piece in the newspaper called The Broken Trust That's Essay. That's right. In fact, I'm going to ask you a little bit about that, if, if I can. Uh, that deals with an institution which is so important here in the state of Hawaii, our largest private landholder, and my alma mater, the Kamehameha Schools. And for all the good it's doing today and has always done since its inception, you helped the public to understand that there was a side of it that needed reform. And that became the book, Broken Trust, which you co-authored with uh, Judge Sam King. Tell us just a little bit about that. And, and didn't it really uh, lift you up to national prominence in the area of the state uh, and trust law? Yeah, this goes back 20 years ago. And um, the five trustees of the um, trust, then known as Bishop Estate, now we call it Kamehameha Schools, um, we're setting a world record for breaches of trust. And I've had people hear that description and laugh and, and it's meant to be, I, you know, catchy. Uh, but it's true. They were literally setting a world record for breaches of trust. 
And, and the story, Judge King and I tell it in the book, Broken Trust, but the short version is because of the dysfunctional politics in the state at that time, um, that institution, which is an incredibly important institution, it's a private institution, a private trust, it's incredibly important here in Hawaii, um, the people who took it over had political con uh, connections that got them where they were. Um, they took good care of their friends. There were uh, unacceptable connections between the trustees of that trust and the judiciary and the executive branch and, and the legislature. Um, a phenomenal amount of, of corruption. And, uh, and eventually, there were five different investigations, and eventually it was a federal agency, which is terribly important, just like now in Hawaii, we've got a criminal investigation of rail by the feds. Right. Um, oftentimes, it's the feds that come in and, and make the difference. Um, same sort of thing with, with broken trust. I'm not sure our local judiciary was ever really going to um, do what needed to be done, but the feds came in and removed all five trustees and set new rules for the selection of trustees so that since then it's been far less politicized. Um, I'm sure it's not run perfectly, but from my standpoint, it's run dramatically better than it was 20 years ago. And I think keeping politics out of that particular trust is um, uh, the main reason why it's yes. running so much better. Well, thanks for that background. And I wanted our viewers to get a little glimpse into your credentials and your qualification in terms of looking at institutions and different operations here in the state of Hawaii. You've observed a lot, and you bring that to bear on your observations of the rail. So tell me, what do you see just briefly right now going on at in the rail. In, we, we've got all kinds of things on the surface people are aware of. We were supposed to cost maybe two to three billion dollars at the beginning and now it's ten billion or more. It was a project that was supposed to be efficiently done and we should be, have been riding the rail by now. But not, that's not taking place. And uh, in your estimation, what is happening right now? Right. Uh, I, I think the whole project is built on a foundation of deception. Um, if you go back to the beginning, they were promising 10,000 jobs every year, and you know that's it was laughable at the time. And with the benefit of hindsight, it's provably laughable. Uh, they were saying that it was going to cost well for years. They were saying 2.7 billion, and then it inched up to 3 billion, then it inched up, etc. Um, we've had an audit just in the last year that said. They knew before the first shovel had been put into the ground that they were never going to come in at the original budget, and it was never going to be on, on schedule. Um, now it's way over budget, and it's way delayed. You know, it was supposed to be operating already um, every three minutes uh, beginning last year, and now you're looking at 2026 at, at the earliest for it. So there's, there's all this deception in the past, and I mentioned that in answering your question about where we are right now, because unfortunately it, it hasn't really changed. Um, the, the CEO of Hart, who's in charge of, of, of doing this, has recently said that, that the critics have calculated that stopping at Middle Street would save $440 million. Well, he calculated that. We think it would save billions of dollars, at least two or three billion, probably four or, or more. So one, to come up with the number that he came up with, which is absurd, but two, to attribute it to us in uh, pieces that he has done publicly just strikes me as, as just um, not an honest way to do it. He said over the two years that he's been here, the budget has been stable and the schedule is, is exactly what it was. But if you look at Hart's recovery plan that they've submitted to the FDA, and the FDA hasn't approved it yet, but Hart has said, well, we think that we're going to come in at the current budget figure, and we think that we're going to come in at the current schedule. But as part of this recovery plan, we'll go ahead and take the higher number and the later date. Well, they're giving the FTA one set of, <laughs> of answers and telling the public about a different set of answers, which is just inherently dishonest, I believe. 
whenever he talks about how much rail is projected to cost, he'll give a number and then say excluding interest. Well, interest is a real cost. It's going to have to be paid by the taxpayers, and to exclude it when talking about what rail is going to cost strikes me as inherently misleading. Well, we obviously could go down a very long litany of deceptions. Let, let me give you one more. Right, we'll in a that. piece he wrote in the Star Advertiser a commentary just a couple of weeks ago, he described their approach to things as, as transparent, that they continue to be transparent. Well, this is the same heart that a year ago in dealing with the state auditor um, resisted the straight auditor's attempts to get uh, minutes, and when they finally got some of the minutes, they were redacted to where the auditor said they were totally meaningless, and, and uh, they would allow part employees to be interviewed only if there was a supervisor there at the time of the interview, and the auditor said this is really not in a spirit of cooperation. Well, how you can do that and then describe your operation as transparent just strikes me as um, uh, deceptive. This whole practice of deception, which you could chronicle from the beginning to the current time and project into the future, is something that just can't happen by itself, however, can it? I mean, don't we set up accountability structures? We've got a state government, we've got the city and county government, the Honolulu Rail Board, the HART, oh, Honolulu Area Rapid Transit Board. How is it that a board watching over this process from the beginning and a city council along with mayor can allow deception to take place? Yeah. Well, going back 20 years with the old Bishop Estate, now Kamehameha Schools controversy, um, there you had a world record of breaches of trust over a long period of time, and you look at that and say, how could that happen? Well, it, the short answer is the dysfunctional political circumstances at the time. I think it's the same thing now. And, and by that, dysfunctional political circumstances, you're referring to, what, the, the absence of com competition in the party system? Yeah, I, I mean, and, and I don't think it's because Hawaii is dominated by Democrats, I think we'd have the same problem if it were as dominated by Republicans as it is by Democrats. But we don't have a two-party system here. And so we've got this rail project that has been a total debacle. That's what the Wall Street Journal called it. That's Other right. national publications have called it a, a fiasco. I mean, it's, it's about to set a world, a world record, if you will, for rail projects that have gone over budget and taken more time, and, and that's just the beginning of, of all the problems. And yet, who in our congressional delegation, I mean, we're spending federal dollars, but who in our congressional delegation has said one negative word about the rail project? What can you recall of the governor saying a negative word about the rail project? And the point is, if there were fingerprints of the other political party on that project, then it would get some scrutiny. There would be some accountability. But because of what I think of as our dysfunctional politics in Hawaii, it's, we're an island community dominated by one party. And again, to be the libertarians, you know, whatever party it is, if there's that kind of total domination, I think you're going to have problems. Think about it for a minute. I've explained to people outside Hawaii that we've got a recent police chief who has been indicted. Well, you know, before we go on, I'm going to ask you to hold that because we're going to take a quick break, Randy, and then we'll come back and talk okay. about what you're hinting at, and that is the culture of transparency or lack of transparency in our state. But uh, we'll wait until after the break. Okay. There's a lot more to hear from Randy Roth when we come back from a break. I'm Kili'i Akina. You're watching Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Don't go away because I'm going to ask Randy about the future of rail and what best solutions we have before us at this time. We'll see you back in a moment. Aloha, I'm Cynthia Sinclair. And I'm Tim Apicella. We are hosts here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you'd go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks, Thanks so much. So much. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence. 
leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go beyond the lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Thanks for coming back. I'm sure you're fascinated by what my guest Randy Roth has to say about the Honolulu Rail, and we're going to jump right back into that conversation in a moment. Recently, the Wall Street Journal published a piece on the Hawaii Rail. It wasn't about trade winds and uh, beautiful mountains and oceans and beaches. It was about how we have one of the biggest debacles in public works projects in our country and in the world. It, that's not the kind of press Hawaii really needs nor wants. And yet, for some reason, the people of Hawaii seem to tolerate it. I'm going to ask Randy why he thinks that is in just a moment. But first, we'll resume with a story you were telling about many examples of a lack of transparency and dishonesty taking place in our world here, our political and our civic world. There is a political culture um, that I think includes a lack of accountability, a lack of, of transparency, uh, a lack of what I'd call political competition. And the indicators that it's a dysfunctional situation, you've got a recent police chief who's been indicted for serious crimes. You've got the prosecutor for the city and county of Honolulu who's received a target letter which generally means that somebody's about to be indicted. Now, the police chief and the prosecutor are supposed to be the watchdogs. Supposed to be the watchdogs at the top of the, the pyramid, if you will, of watchdogs. But then you come down a, 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 a rung, and right under the police chief, you've got five members of the elite intelligence unit who have either pled guilty or been indicted or about to be indicted. Um, you've got at least one deputy prosecutor who has, at least if the media is to be believed, committed some very serious transgressions in her position as uh, deputy prosecutor. Again, she will um, uh, has some, a trial coming up. You've got uh, Corp Counsel. This is the top in-house lawyer for the city who's received a target letter, which again, presumably means, normally means that they're about to be uh, indicted. Um, that's amazing that all at the same time involving different alleged wrongdoings, and you've also got the Lion Construction Company that has pled guilty and identified various state employees who reportedly have accepted bribes in exchange for giving large contracts to this construction company. And you've got this, I think it's going to be 10 to $13 billion rail project that is currently under criminal investigation by the FBI. Uh, I can't think of places elsewhere in the United States, maybe Chicago, maybe New Orleans. There are a few places that have had a lot of high officials who've been indicted or threatened with indictment. I don't know of any that have had this many, all at the same time, seemingly unrelated. Several of them are related, but most of them seem not to be. And then people ask me, do you think there's any fraud with the rail project just because it started out at a couple billion and now we're up to 10 billion and we think it's headed up to 13 billion dollars? It would be remarkable if, if there wasn't fraud. The city auditor, Two and a half years ago, when he wrote his report, he said, talking about waste, fraud, and abuse, he said there were no internal controls for the years that he was looking at the rail project. He said they, the people working in Hart, they wouldn't know if there was fraud. They wouldn't have a way of detecting it because they lacked internal controls. I trace all of this back to a dysfunctional political environment and anything that involves billions of dollars in this state ends up being political sooner or later. And I think the rail project is the only way you can explain how it's gotten this far is politics. You know, and I want to make it clear that you're not saying that it's the Democrats 
you, you're saying that it's whoever. It could be the Republicans. The problem is that there's not a second party of significant size and, and capacity to be able to challenge a party. And, yeah. you know, this is the Hawaii that we live in. As you were going down that long list, and you weren't complete, by the way, <laughs> uh, of potential fraud and waste and yeah. abuse in our government and criminality and so forth, I was just realizing that if I were sitting in another city and somebody who lived in that city told me that story about their city, I'd be shocked. I'd be stunned. But here in Hawaii, there's a kind of malaise. We see these headlines. They're in the news constantly. We get used to it. Why do you think it is that the people tolerate this in Hawaii? Well, for starters, why wouldn't a member of our congressional delegation say something about what appears to be an amazing level scope of, of corruption in this. Why wouldn't they be saying something about that? They say a lot about Trump and, and what's going on in Washington, D.C. Why wouldn't what appears to be a huge amount of corruption in their own community, why wouldn't they say something? Why wouldn't they go on record? Well, why wouldn't the do you, governor? Do you think it has anything to do with the fact that a prominent Democrat politician did do that. That was Ben Cayetano. And the consequences he faced uh, for that were quite severe. It, it, it's, it's a perfect example. One, it took a lot of guts for him to do what he did. And two, they taught him a lesson in the sense that they whacked him real hard, which you can do when you've got total political domination in a, in a community like Democrats here. And, and as you were saying, it's not that it's Democrats, it's that it's one party and they have total dominance over a long period of time. Uh, it could just as easily be Republicans or Libertarians or Greens or some other group. It just happens in this case to be Democrats. You mentioned earlier that the capacity to look out for fraud, waste, and abuse isn't present in this, the rail system. Did you elaborate a bit on that? Well, that was. I mean, I, I thought there have to be checks and balances. There are yeah. audits galore. There are financial audits. There are federal compliance audits. And, and there's the state legislative audit. There's city and county audits. Uh, uh, there's a board that watches over the operations of the administration. So, how is it that we don't have the capacity with which to really ferret out fraud, waste, and abuse? Yeah, well, there have been some terrific. Audits. The city auditor, Edwin Young, did a terrific job and, among other things, pointed out the absence of internal controls that, that Hart wouldn't itself at that time know whether there was uh, waste, fraud, or, or abuse. Uh, Les Condo, the, the state auditor, just uh, beginning this year, has issued, I think it's the first three of three, four, the four installments that, uh, that he's going to, to issue. He did a terrific job, especially under difficult circumstances where, where Hart was resisting, clearly resisting that. They talk about, oh, we gave lots of documents, et cetera. Well, you can give lots of documents that are meaningless documents. What they didn't do was cooperate on the most important documents, were the minutes of those, uh, those closed-door meetings that the, the Hart board had. So there have been some, some good audits, but... That's part of what I'm calling the political dysfunction in that they just sit there and nothing seems to happen. The feds are in the middle of a criminal investigation, so that has the potential. Just like when the feds got involved, things happened with respect to the Bishop Estate trustees. The trustees were, were ousted. Um, so maybe there's hope because the feds are now involved in rail. Um, but just as a practical matter, there is some benefit to rail. It shouldn't have started in the first place, but now that you've got rail as far as it is, if they completed the middle street, that provides some value, getting people past the H1, H2 interchange, to get past the, the middle street um, merge. Those are the choke points. And so there is some value to get them to middle street. But beyond that, no. Beyond that, you're better off just to have buses or Ubers or whatever taking people to their, directly to their actual destination so from you're, Middle So you're Street. not saying, let's just stop the project, tear down the, the rail, and uh, completely end it. You're, you're, you're suggesting that there is a workable solution now that could integrate with the rest of the transportation grid it, in it, Exactly. You, you never would have started in the first place if you knew that it was only going to go to Middle Street because the cost-benefit just 
doesn't make sense, but, but we've spent it. After you've spent as much money has been spent, you've got as much concrete poured, you've got that, that route all the way to the, to the airport now, and I'm very much dependent on, on Panos Prevoderis' expertise, the chairman of the uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at, at the University of, of Hawaii. Uh, Panos has said there really is some value. Now that they've gone this far, there is some value once they get to Middle Street but not in continuing beyond Middle Street. So I'm quite hopeful that, um, that there can be enough of a public voice, if you will, saying stop at Middle Street, save us billions of dollars. Uh, whether, whether that happens or not, we'll see. Quickly, the city and county, in the face of a loss of massive funding potentially from the federal government, has pitched a public-private partnership to involve the private sector at this time. Do you see this as the way to bail the rail out? Well, first of all, the people at heart are saying that this will both move risk from the taxpayers to the private sector and save money. Um, and it's almost like they're trying to sell the Brooklyn Bridge or, or something. The private, tech, the private sector will take risk that otherwise the taxpayers would have, but at a premium. That's you know, right. They, they want to get paid to take that risk. And so uh, it's insulting. It may not be a balanced P3. It, it's, it's just insulting the way they're talking about it. But also, the P3 is designed to make it difficult, once those bids come in, make it difficult to identify just how much is being spent to finish the rail project because they're they're putting it together with 30 years of operation and maintenance expenses, which will be a huge number, and how you allocate between how much of that is for construction of rail and how much of that is for 30 years of operation and maintenance is, is kind of a, a pencil-pushing well, process. We're going to have to conclude on that note, and what you're leaving us with is a cliffhanger. In other words, you're saying, if we haven't been able to watch the cost so far, look out during the next 30 or so years because we're dealing with billions of dollars. Absolutely. And, and FTA, you've got some complicity in this thing. Number one, you'd never be able to take back the money that you've already provided. But number two, you have a statutory oversight which you have not provided. You better get on the ball and uh, help the locals here decide to stop at Middle Street. Well, we'll be watching what you write and say in the future. You recently did an op-ed piece. Uh, what was entitled, if anyone wants to Google it? My op-ed piece? In Star Ad? Um, I don't remember the title. <laughs> so just Google <laughs> Randall Roth, Honolulu Rail, you and go. you'll get some good stuff. There Randy, you go. thank you very much. Good to have you on the program, as thank always. You. Appreciate you. your expertise and your commitment to what's good in Hawaii. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for being with us today on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. My guest, Randall Roth, is well known for his insightful understanding of what's taking place in our institutions and in our government in the state. Until next time, I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute, wishing you the best from ThinkTech Hawaii. Aloha.